I'm glad we can gather together again. What a beautiful day the Lord blessed us with, and uh, you can tell it's the fall time of the year. You have to turn the heat on in the morning, the air conditioning in the afternoon. That's uh, it's always a funny time of year, but glad we can be back out tonight and enjoy the Fellowship of the Saints. Members, be aware we do have a brief business meeting uh, to follow tonight. So just a quick, uh, quick business meeting. I say that I should never say that I suppose, but it should be should be a quick business meeting after the evening service. Just a couple of announcements before we begin uh, with singing. Uh, first of all, uh, we have a great problem, but it is a bit of an issue. So we're running out of parking, uh, which is which is a, a, an issue. Um, but uh, please, if you can, on this side of the bill of the building, um, we're going to try to avoid parking on the grass on that side of the building. And so if we have to do extra parking, we're going to try to move the vehicles forward in our middle section here so that we can park along the fence uh, area uh, rather than over here and uh, just to be good neighbors and not park on property. Our property only goes just off the grass to the telephone pole. That's, that's the edge of our property. So uh, we're going to try to get a parking attendant out there to move us all around. But it's a great problem to have. But Sunday mornings now we're running into to, too, many, too many vehicles, which is... Uh, which is great, but uh, we'll, we'll work on that. Once all of the construction is done, then we are going to, to resurface our parking lot and rearrange the lines and we will have our, our, uh, our parking lot back to right so we shouldn't have that issue again. But just for now, if you can avoid parking on the side here, that would be very helpful on, on the grass. Um, but other than that, uh, I wanted to mention as well the ministry and hospitality. We have one group, there's two young men, uh, actually three men, uh, that need housing for that weekend of Thanksgiving weekend. So if you have opportunity for them, that would be great, and uh, that'll help us out as well. Other than that, we announced everything, I think, this morning, so we won't take up too much time to uh, further announcements. Let's start with singing 537, Jesus Saves. Caleb, you come. Praise the Lord that Jesus saves us all. Stand as we sing this song. We're going to sing verse 1, 3, and 4 of Jesus Saves. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings. Father, thank you for the truth we have just sung back to you, a sacrifice of praise that Jesus Christ saves. And we praise you for his wonderful grace that he would come from heaven's glory and take on human flesh, that he would become the God-man. Thank you that he, Lord, was willing to humble himself and become obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. And Lord, that he powerfully triumphed over death three days later. We rejoice in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the reality of the salvation we find in him. And so as we gather in your name tonight, I pray that you would be honored and lifted up. Lord, we do pray for the needs of our church family. We pray for those facing physical struggle and challenge for those ill. And Lord, we just pray that you would restore and strengthen and encourage them. Lord, during physical difficulty, it's often a time of spiritual challenge as well. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give them grace and patience for the trial. Lord, for those grieving losses, for those dealing with the aftermath of the storm and still and Lord, all the restoration that must happen, we just pray that you would give grace and strength for each one. Lord, that you would be near your saints and that you would allow this time to be an opportunity for the gospel and to share our hope is not in our homes or our possessions, our hope is in you. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would guide us to be testimonies of Christ. 
Lord, as we gather tonight, may we lift our voices together with one mind, one heart, one accord, singing your praises and the joy of knowing that Jesus saves, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, Caleb. Next song tonight is I Love to Tell the Story. Because Jesus saves, we should, this should be our theme. We're going to sing the first, second, and fourth of this song, I Love to Tell the Story. Hymn number 530, Rescue the Perishing. We're singing the first, second, and fourth of this song, Rescue the Perishing. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Before the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them.
last song for tonight is hymn number 534, Send the Light. Let's all stand as we sing all three verses of this song, Send the Light. There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless waves and the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save, send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine. shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light, send the light. And the golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light, send the light. Send the light, send the, light. the blessed gospel. Sing tonight. You may be seated at this time. I'd like to invite my wife Ruth to come up here, and we're going to sing a special for you tonight. found this holy place 
underneath his wings of love, trusting in my God above, grace for every need, grace that overflows and far exceeds, lavished on my soul at Calvary. His grace, only by His grace, God's Wonderful to reflect on the grace of God for us. And it is only by His grace that we are saved, that we are sanctified. Exodus chapter 21. It's always interesting as a pastor when you announce beforehand what you're going to preach on. I didn't know all of you had interest in property rules, so this is good. It's a blessing to see you out tonight, and it's encouraging. Exodus chapter 21, as we have looked at the law, we recognize that the rules that God puts in place for his people evidence his character. It shows what he values. And so as we considered a couple of Sunday evenings ago, God values human life, the sanctity of human life. And so those that take it, those that smite a person, those that kill, they are going to face judgment. And he puts in the law the sanctity of human life, even to the sanctity of the unborn. And he says in Exodus chapter 21, verse 22, if men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her and yet no mischief follow, he shall surely be punished. And in verse 23, and if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. And here the unborn are viewed as a life and the sanctity of human life. I wanted to make mention of this when I preached through this last time. Uh, Sometimes the language here can be a little difficult. You might think, and if it says in verse 22, uh, if her fruit depart from her, we think of departing as the idea of of death, but that's not the idea here. The idea is if her fruit, that is her, her baby, is born prematurely, and yet, in verse 22, no mischief follow. So the baby is hurt, in, and not hurt at all. Men strive, the lady births prematurely, but no mischief follows, no harm follows to the baby. Then there's a penalty to pay for striking the woman, but there's no, there's no life for life. But, in verse 23, if mischief follow. So the idea of departing from here or there is not the idea of, of death, but of her birthing the baby prematurely. And if nothing is wrong with the baby, no, no defect, no disability, then there's just a payment to be made, a fine to be paid. But if there is a problem with the baby, then in verse 23, 24, and 25, whatever happened to the baby is to happen to the person. And so God defends life, even from the womb, and he defends the sanctity of human life. And now in in chapter 21 and verse number 33, we're going to move to a section of law about property. And it's interesting to see that God values individual property. God values what we are given by him. Everything that we have is from God. We are simply stewards of what God has given us, but God institutes rights for those that have property and those that would be negligent and harm or cause loss to another person or even steal it. And so the focus of the first part of chapter 21 has been on the sixth command, thou shalt not kill. And now we're going to move to a focus on the eighth command, thou shalt not steal, and dealing with property loss. And so in Exodus chapter 21, verse 33, and if a man shall open a pit, or if a man shall dig a pit and not cover it, and an ox or a donkey fall therein, the owner of the pit shall make it good and give money unto the owner of them, and the dead beast shall be his. And if one man's ox hurt another, that he die, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the money of it, and the dead ox also they shall divide. Or if it be known that the ox hath used to push in time past, and his owner hath not kept him in, he shall surely pay for ox, and the dead shall be his own. If a man shall steal an ox, or a sheep, and kill it, or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox, and four sheep for a sheep. If a thief be found breaking up, and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him." If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. 
If the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, whether it be ox or donkey or sheep, he shall restore double. If a man shall cause a field or vineyard to be eaten and shall put in his beast and shall feed in another man's field of the best of his own field and of the best of his own vineyard, shall he make restitution. If fire break out and catch in thorns, so the stacks of corn and the standing corn in the field be consumed therewith, he that kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. If a man shall deliver unto his neighbor money or stuff to keep, and it be stolen out of the man's hand, if the thief be found, let him pay double. If the thief be not found, then the master of the house shall be brought unto the judges to see whether he hath put his hand into his neighbor's goods. For all manner of trespass, whether it be for an ox, for a donkey, for sheep, for raiment, or for any manner of lost thing, which another challengeth to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, and whom the judges shall condemn, he shall pay double unto his neighbor. If a man deliver unto his neighbor a donkey, or an ox, or a sheep, or a beast to keep and a die, or be hurt or driven away, no man seeing it, then shall an oath of the Lord be between them both, that he that hath not put his hand unto his neighbor's goods, and the owner of it shall accept thereof, and he shall not make it good. And if it be stolen from him, he shall make restitution unto the owner thereof. If it be torn in pieces, then him bring it for witness, and he shall make good, not make good, that which was torn. And if a man borrow out of his neighbor, and if it be hurt or die, the owner thereof being not with it, he shall surely make it good. But if the owner thereof be with it, he shall not make it good. If it be an hired thing, it came for his hire. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth. I pray you guide us into it tonight, that you would shape our hearts and minds according to your character. Lord, that we would value what you value, that we would live lives of holiness and integrity. And Lord, that we would be a testimony for Christ in our giving and in how we deal with the property of others. We pray that you would guide us by your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Here in this section, once again, we have causistic laws that are if-then statements. And as we talked about last time, God is not necessarily uh, condoning all of this activity. He's regulating sometimes what he does not condone. But he is saying, if this happens, then do this. If this happens, then do this. And as you walk through these scenarios, I want you to consider, why does God have to put in all of these if statements? Why does God have to, to cover the breadth of what he covers here? And I think the answer will become evident that God knows our hearts and God knows our, our selfishness. God knows what we're like. And so as we look at this, it's, it's interesting to me how many different scenarios God puts in and God cannot possibly cover all possible scenarios. But even in some of these if statements, there's, there's an understanding that man can be conniving. Man cannot always be honest. <laughs> and so God puts these if then statements in to say, I know what you're like. I know what you might be up to. And here's how you deal with that. So let's dive in. First of all, we see the, the loss of property and the responsibility. If you have caused loss of property, it is your responsibility to own up for that, to pay up for it. As we look at these, you're going to notice a lot of talk about livestock. I don't know anybody in here that has an ox. Now, maybe you do, and you can come see me, but I don't think any of you have an ox in your backyard or a donkey, maybe a sheep. Uh, I don't know, uh, but, but probably not. So as we read this, you think, well, this doesn't really make sense to me. Well, we need to understand it in the context of the agrarian society in which it is written. Your animals were your judgment of your wealth. What you had for your ox and for your donkey and for your sheep, that was your measure of your wealth. And so if you read Job chapter 1, how is his wealth measured? He has this many camels, he has this many sheep, he has this many donkeys. That's how your wealth was measured. It was, it was, it was your livelihood. You had your animals that provided for you, and it provided meat for you. You were able to eat them. They provided wool for you to make clothing. They provided for you to be able to, to work the fields. And so you'd, you'd have a donkey bear your burdens and transport you. You'd have an oxen to, to derive your plow. These were the way you made your living. These were how you survived in an agrarian society. We might update it today to say your vehicle, how you get around, how you get to work. You need that. It's important. It's valuable to have a car. You can call your car your ox if you want to or your donkey, but that's how the transportation was made. Or perhaps you can think of it as your, as your livelihood, your tools that you use for your livelihood. If somebody takes that property from you, they're not only depriving you of those tools, they're also depriving you of the opportunity to make a living. And so for a doctor, you might have certain stethoscope or scalpels or, or, or tools that you use. For a mechanic, you have your tools. And I know mechanics love their tools and they have their tool chest and they know exactly where everything is. Their wives may not be able to understand it, but they know exactly where everything is. And, and, and those tools, those, those realities are important for their, for their livelihood. 
And so understanding that animals were your measure of your wealth, they were in, uh, critical for you to survive. It's how you worked your land. It's how you produced, field for your fam- uh, uh, produced food for your family. And we know that a number of people in the Old Testament had wealth in livestock. You remember Abraham? He comes out in Genesis chapter 13 and has so, many, so much livestock that he and Lot have to split up because of the amount of, of livestock he has. And Jacob makes his fortune in Genesis chapter 30. It's always an interesting one. I, don't, I wonder how much of husbandry he knew, and it seems very calculated, but he had the spotted and speckled, and then he put the reeds in while they were drinking, and, and he had this whole breeding program to make himself rich and Laban to become poor. And then Laban catches on to it, so he switches the income. He says, no, no, you get the, 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 the speckled and, and, and uh, spotted ones, and so Jacob switches his breeding program, and he keeps getting the stronger ones, and, and Laban keeps getting poor, and then eventually Jacob realizes, i got to get out of here, <laughs> because if I don't, Laban's going to do something to me, so he leaves. But how was he getting wealthy? He was getting wealthy by trading in sheep and goats. That's, that's the society. We might put it in stocks or bonds or, 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 or real estate or some other thing in our modern society. But animals were important, and they were vital to you and in an agrarian society. And so in verse 33 to 36, we have dealing with issues that bring another property, person's property harm. In verse 33, we deal with negligence. Negligence. If you own property and you dig a pit, and you could dig a pit for a variety of reasons. Some of them would dig pits for uh, irrigation ponds in their land to be able to provide water for their fields. You could dig a pit for burial. You could, you could dig a pit for a variety of reasons. But if you dig a pit... In verse 33, there is a responsibility that you have to mitigate the danger that that pit could cause. And so, in verse 33, if you open a pit and do not cover it, if you don't provide the means of of safety, of protection from harm that could come from your property, then if harm comes, if an ox wanders over and falls in your pit or a donkey falls in your pit, then there is to be restitution. Verse 34, the owner of the pit shall make it good. You're to pay for the damage that came to the loss of property of your neighbor. You can't just say, oh well, stupid donkey, (laughs) foolish ox, he shouldn't have been wandering on my property. He shouldn't have been anywhere near my pit. (laughs) You you have to take responsibility for your pit digging, for the loss of property that came to your neighbor. Now in verse 34, it's interesting, he's to give money to the owner of them and the dead beast shall be his. So God understands that sometimes animals wander off, and sometimes you can't mitigate all the possible risks. Uh, Those that are in the insurance business or in liability, I love those people, but those people, anytime you bring up an idea or a project, they say, but pastor, (laughs) we have to think about this, we have to worry about this, that we could be in danger here, what about the liability of that? And, And we need those people. But, but every risk can't be mitigated. If we, if we were trying to mitigate every risk, you wouldn't do anything. You'd just stay home. And so, uh, but, but we are to, to be careful. If we dig a pit, we're supposed to cover it. We're supposed to put up uh, signs to say caution if we have, if we have a, a, a potential issue. You see the construction site across the, the uh, parking lot. They have signs up, no trespassing. They have fences up to keep people out. They have to do that as part of liability, part of risk management so that there's no loss. But if that happens, if there is loss, then you pay for it, you make it good, you pay for that ox or that donkey, you you give them the the, the, uh, fair market value, but you get the meat. (laughs) So the dead animal is yours. And if it's mangled and you can't get anything out of it, that's your loss. If you you can get something out of it, then you get something out of it. In other words, God understands that sometimes things happen that you tried your best to, to mitigate your, your uh, negligence. You tried your best to, to, to uh, not cause harm, but harm came. And so, yes, you have to pay for it, but you get to keep the ox. You get to keep the donkey, and you can use it for some good. You can salvage something out of it. And so, if we have an accident, we understand who's, who's to blame. Okay, if it's your fault, then... You pay for the damages. You pay what, what is necessary to fix the person's car that you ran into. Um, and, and so this is the kind of idea here. If you cause loss through negligence to a, to a neighbor, then you have to pay for it. This goes to, in verse 35, when you have your animals and you are responsible for the effects of your animals. It's interesting that God places responsibility on the owner for what his animal does. And so if your ox gets in a fight with another ox, and he dies, that, that oxen dies, then here's what happens. You sell the live ox, you divide the money of it, and the dead ox you divide. <laughs> so everybody gets something out of it, 
The, 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 nobody gets to, the, the person's live ox doesn't get to stay alive. He doesn't get to keep his ox while the other person just has a dead ox to eat. No, they have to sell the live ox. They have to divide the money. The dead ox has to be divided. In other words, you make it good. You, you make a fair remuneration for the loss of that oxen. And you don't get to keep your live ox. Even if you're not, it's not like you took the ox out and, and made the ox fight the other ox. <laughs> you're not trying to have your oxen beat up another ox or kill another ox. And yet, God says, you are responsible for your property. For what you own, you are responsible. And so, if you have an ox that kills another ox, you have to sell it. You, you, you can't keep it. And, and, that, and, and, you, and it's fair, you divide it, but you have to take responsibility for what you have. And I think there's an allergy, there's lots of allergies in our world, but I think it, particularly in my generation and younger, there's an allergy to responsibility. It's, it, it's a, it, it's, it's a hands-off, oh, it wasn't my fault, no, I didn't do it. And God says, no, you are responsible, <laughs> and you need to take responsibility for what is yours. Even if you say, well, I didn't mean to. I know you didn't take your ox out and have an ox fighting ring. <laughs> I know you didn't intend for your ox to kill the other ox. You're still responsible. And kids... <laughs> You're still responsible, even if you say, well, I didn't mean to hit my sister. I didn't mean to hurt her. Well, when you threw that book at her, you, you, you are responsible for that action, even though you didn't mean to. And so God says you take responsibility. You, you take ownership. And the live ox is sold. The dead one is divided. And there's remuneration paid. Now, it's different in verse 36 if you know better. So in verse 36, there is an allowance for sort of, just, you still have to take responsibility, but ignorance is somewhat of a defense. But in verse 36, if you knew that your ox used to push in times past, if you know the temperament of your ox, and when you have animals, you get to know their temperaments. And if you know you have a particularly ornery oxen, and you don't mitigate that, you don't keep it in, in verse 36, you don't pen it up, then, if the ox goes and kills, it's different altogether. And so in verse 36, he shall surely pay ox for ox, and the dead shall be his own. If you don't keep your ornery ox in, you get the dead one. <laughs> you get the salvageable one, and the other guy gets the live ox. He gets the good ox. Now, I don't know if you wanted the ornery ox or not, but that's what you got if the ox happened to kill. In other words, God says in his law and the value of fairness and property loss, there is a defense of ignorance. I didn't intend for, I didn't know that my ox was out there. But if you do know, there's a heightened level of responsibility for what you are aware of. And so the more you know, the more you're aware of, the more you are responsible for. And kids, this is just the way life works. <laughs> So as you age and you, you, you want to grow up, I know, you say, I just can't wait to grow up. I can't wait to be an adult and do all those fun adult things like staying up whenever I want and eating whatever I want. And Yes, when you get to that stage of adulthood, you get to have some freedom. But guess what? It comes with responsibility. And the more that you know and the more that you have, you are responsible for before God. And so don't get too excited. Your parents will tell you you don't want all of this responsibility. You don't necessarily want all of, all of that. Enjoy your childhood. But understand responsibility. God holds them accountable for their property and what their ox does, in particular if they knew better. Interestingly, in the ancient times, they would often keep in the courtyard of their homes, they would keep their larger animals. And they would keep them in at night. The, the smaller animals, like sheep and goats, they would keep out in the fields. And you've seen the pictures of pens that they built, usually against a cliff edge. Uh, they would put up against the cliff, and they would build a, a semicircle, and they would have their sheep and their goats out in the wild uh, at night. But their larger animals, like oxen, they would bring into their courtyard. Why would they do that? Because they knew they can get into a whole lot of trouble if they're not kept in. So you have to be responsible for your property. Now, this continues in chiastic form down to verse 5. We're going to come back to verse 1 to 4. But this continues in terms of property loss from verse 5 down to verse number 15. In verse number 5, this is the issue of a person letting their animal graze in somebody else's field. Now, again, we don't necessarily have this issue. I live in farming country, so I could possibly have this issue. But, but this, is, this isn't something that's very common. The point is, if you're using the resources of somebody else for your own advantage and not compensating them for it, guess what? You've got to take responsibility and compensate them for it. And so, he says, if you let your, your beast wander over to neighbor John's field and he eats the best of the vineyard and tramples down the field, 
you've got to pay from your own pocket, from your vineyard or your field, and you've got to remunerate that. We don't necessarily see this in our world. I do see it somewhat out my way. My neighbor has large cornfields, and the cornfields are used for feed for his cows. But the bears love corn, and they will make a major, major mess when they go into that field. And they will eat lots of corn, and they will trample down and ruin. They can ruin all kinds of corn in one night uh, because of that. And so uh, this is the type of idea. If an animal wanders into the field and then not only eats but tramples down and ruin, like the rabbit in, in the garden, and we all know famous rabbits that have ruined gardens, but this is the idea. If they do that, then guess what? You're responsible for your animal's action. <laughs> you have to pay it back. You, have to, you didn't do what was responsible in keeping your beast in, so you have to pay up. And in verse number five, notice this, of the best of his own field, the best of his own vineyard, shall he make restitution. What do we like to make restitution with? I know you gave me a brand new one, but <laughs> it's broken, so I'll give you this 20-year-old thing that I have laying around. We like to make restitution with the worst of what we have, but God says that's not the way it works. If you cause property loss to somebody else, you have to give them of your best, of, of what, you, what is the best of your vineyard, of the best of your fields. That's what you make restitution of. And so if you kill their, their three-year-old donkey, you don't get to send a 20-year-old donkey back. <laughs> you, have to, you have to give of the best to them. Then in verse 6, we deal with arson. This is the case of property loss because of fire. And this can happen in an agrarian society, and fire is very damaging and very destructive. It can ruin a whole crop. And if that happens in verse number six, if there's the, the, the stacks of corn or the standing grain be consumed with a fire, he that kindles the fire shall surely make restitution. But I didn't mean to. Doesn't matter. <laughs> if you started the fire, you say, well, I didn't mean to when I, when I, when I, when I, when I lit that uh, fire, when I had that campfire, whatever, if you're responsible for the, for the fire, then, and it causes property damage, then you are to pay for it. And there's restitution to be made. And you're to make up the loss for that person. And again, you say, well, that, why, why so, such a big deal about corn? Because you go to the store and you buy your corn off the shelf. But in this day, if you have your, your crop in, if you have standing corn or you have it in, gathered in, and somebody burns that, that's like somebody taking your paycheck and burning your paycheck for the year. You get one crop, one, one harvest in the year. So you can imagine if you were paid annually and somebody came along and burnt your paycheck, you might have a problem with that. You might have, you understand the seriousness of this and they are required to make restitution. Then in verse number seven to verse 13, it deals with property loss that is difficult to discern who's responsible because sometimes it's hard to know who's responsible for what. Ever had a, had a, had a property loss or property damage and nobody would fess up to it? Nobody would, would, would tell exactly what happened? Children, how did the vase get broken? That's the classic one, right? And Well, I don't know. A bird flew in the window. I'm not sure how it happened. But, but it's hard sometimes to discern. God knows our hearts. It's interesting that God knows our conniving hearts because when we are called to be responsible for our actions, what does our natural heart want to do? We want to be selfish. We don't want to give any more than we have to. We don't want to make restitution. So God knows this. So verse 7, if a man delivers into his neighbor money or stuff to keep, so he gives his neighbor, for safekeeping, a sum of money or some of his possessions, and his neighbor agrees to take that into his care, to store it for him. If it happens that it's stolen out of the man's house, all of a sudden the property that was, the, that was loaned is now gone. Oops, <laughs> you had that on loan and now it's gone. If the thief be found, if you can prove that it was stolen and you find the thief that's responsible for stealing it, guess what? He pays double. He pays back not only what was stolen, but he pays back a, a, an equal amount. And so it's double what the original was. So if he stole, if you, if you passed in $1,000 to your neighbor and it's in your safe, somebody breaks in, takes the $1,000 home, and you find them with $1,000, they have to pay $2,000 back to the original owner. They have to pay double. But in verse 8, if the thief be not found, because you might say, God knows our conniving hearts, you might say, oh, sure, neighbor, I'll store that for you, no problem. And then you might sell it. <laughs> you might get rid of it. And you could claim, oh, yeah, I'm so sorry, neighbor. I, I tried to, to look after that, but, but I got broken into and somebody stole that $1,000. Never mind, you were just a Cuba <laughs> for vacation. 
You might use it, or you might, and you could claim that, oh, it was just stolen, it was taken away. So if the thief is not found, then the master of the house shall be brought unto the judges to see whether he hath put his hand into his neighbor's goods. Because God knows our hearts, and God understands that we might sometimes say, oh, it was stolen, somebody came and took it, when in fact we actually used it. We were the ones who took our neighbor's goods and used them for our own benefit. In this case, you have to go before the judges. And every city would have a ruling judge, a ruling judges, and you can see that through the Old, the Old Testament. They would go to the gate, and they would bring the elders of the city together. And, and Boaz's case, you remember in Ruth chapter 4, it's 10, there were 70 in the, in the city of Shechem. There's a variety of numbers. But you would come before the judges, and you would state your case. And you would, you would say, oh yes, it was stolen, I didn't take it. And you would have to bring evidence for that. And you see that in more detail as we work through these verses. So he gets a specific case in verse 9, if it's an ox or a donkey or a sheep or raiments or clothing or any manner of lost things with another challenge to be his, the cause of both parties shall become before the judges. And whom the judges shall condemn, he shall pay double unto his neighbor. So if the judge decides, oh no, you didn't, you, it wasn't stolen from your house. You wore that clothing that you said you would store and you wore it out and then you said, oh, it was stolen. And and they, if they condemned you, you would have to pay double. You would have to pay the thief's price because you had taken what, what wasn't yours. Now, in verse 10, if a man deliver to his neighbor a donkey or an ox or sheep or beast to keep it and it die, or be hurt or driven away, no man seeing it, then shall an oath of the Lord be between them both. And here's what would happen. If there was no way of judging, if you couldn't tell, there was no evidence one way or the other. If there was evidence in verse 9, then you just made the man pay double. But there are some situations where the man says, listen, I, I didn't take it. it, it I, I had it in my house and it's gone, but I didn't take it. Somebody stole it. Where's the thief? I don't know, but, but I, 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 I didn't take it. Then what would happen in verse 11 is you would take an oath before the Lord. So the judges would say, what you need to do is you need to swear before the Lord. You need to take an oath before the Lord that you did not steal your neighbor's goods. And this oath was basically saying, God be the judge over me. Now you do not want that if you're lying about stealing your neighbor's goods. So God puts this in here to say, if it can't be discerned by human wisdom, if the judges can't figure it out, then you must put yourself under oath. And we do this in our courtrooms, do we not? When you go, you can have a dispute outside the courtroom, but when you go to the courtroom, you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me. God, you are putting yourself under oath and you are saying that God will be the ultimate judge of my truthfulness, of my perjury or not. And, and that is a serious thing. Oath, oath taking in the Old Testament was a very serious thing. If you took an oath before God, you were essentially saying that God can be the one to judge my case. And if I'm innocent, then God will prove that if I'm guilty, then God will deal with me in terms of his justice. And this is what Solomon actually prays for in the dedication of the temple. If you turn over to 1 Kings chapter 8, Solomon finishes the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8. And in his prayer of dedication, he says in verse 31, If any man trespass against his neighbor, and an oath be laid upon him to cause him to swear, and the oath come before thine altar in this house, then hear thou in heaven, and do and judge thy servants, condemning the wicked to bring his way upon his head, and justifying the righteous to give him according to his righteousness. So Solomon says in this temple, this is what he's talking about, these situations, that when somebody comes and brings an oath before the Lord, God, you hear it, and you be the judge. And you make sure that justice is meted out. So the guilty party gets judged, gets condemned, and the righteous party is upheld. And so the end of all strife here was an oath before the Lord. And they had to make a, a swearing before God of what had happened. And if that is the case, he hath put not his hand to his neighbor's goods, the owner of it shall accept thereof, and he shall not make it good. So the owner says, you've sworn before God, you're letting God be your judge, and you are going to the level of making an oath before God that you did not take my stuff, I'll let it be. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's fine. And so I will let God be the judge in this case. I don't like it, maybe. I wish I had my stuff back, but I can't prove that you took it. I can't prove that it wasn't stolen or didn't die along the way or, 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 or nobody, nobody saw what happened. There's no evidence. And so I will trust that God will be the one to judge you. 
Now in verse 12 and 13, if it be stolen from him, he shall make restitution on the owner thereof. If it, if it proves that he really did steal it. And so when somebody comes before the Lord and they, have to, they recognize, I have to swear before God, I have to make an oath on whether I did this or not. Okay, maybe I'll fess up. <laughs> maybe I'll say that I really did do this because I don't want the wrath of God on my head. And so if it was stolen, then he makes restitution. But in verse 13, if he can prove it, if it's torn in pieces, let him bring it for a witness, and he shall not make good that which was torn. And so if he can prove it, if he can show that he, he I really did, I, I didn't take it, and he brings some evidence to the judges, then he does not have to make it good because he proves, I didn't do this. It wasn't my fault. And so God wants to be fair. God intends for us to be fair in these, in these proceedings. But the gravity of an oath before God would end all strife. And then verse 14 and 15 deals with borrowing things from your neighbor. And, 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 and this happens, verse 14 and 15, if a man borrow out of his neighbor and it be hurt or die, the owner thereof being not with it, he shall surely make it good. You borrow something and it breaks or it's ruined and the owner isn't with it because sometimes you would have the owner come along with it and use it, then you have to make it good. And this has happened in my life. I don't like borrowing things for this reason, but there are some tools I just don't have and I don't want to pay the price for that tool, so I just borrow it. And inevitably, whenever I borrow it, what happens? It breaks, and then I end up paying double because now I have to pay, buy him one, and then I'm like, if I'm going to buy him one, I might as well buy myself one <laughs> so I don't have to avoid this in the future. And so inevitably I end up paying double, and so I've just learned, you know what, it's better if I just go out and buy the tool myself. But there are some things I'm like, I'm only going to use this once, I don't want to borrow it. But this happens. When you borrow something and it breaks, when you have it, pay up. To make it good. And, and, and if the owner isn't with it, then make it good. Now why does God say if the owner isn't with it? Because God knows our hearts. God knows how conniving we are. And so an owner could say, hey, would you like to borrow my chainsaw? Sure, I'll borrow your chainsaw. Sure. And then the owner comes over and, and it's broken already. And the owner takes it over and starts using it. Oh man, you broke my chainsaw. <laughs> no, that's your fault. You, you were with it and you're the one operating it. It's not my fault. I don't have to buy you a new one. We are so conniving, aren't we? And, and so God knows that we can, that we can connive and, and work our way and, and offer to lend something. I know as kids we did this. If we broke anything at home, we were masters at repairing it just enough so one of our siblings would break it. I'm sure you've done this. We'd break a doorknob and I'd set it up just so that the next person who turned it would break it. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's on you. You broke the doorknob. We, we, we're masters at this. We're conniving at this. We don't want to take responsibility. God says, no, it doesn't work that way. You have to take responsibility. But if the owner is with it, <laughs> then he takes responsibility to avoid any kind of fraud. Then in verse 15, he says, the owner thereof be with it, he shall make it, not make it good. If it be hired thing, it came for his hire. And here's another category. If the owner thereof be with it, he's not, he doesn't have to make it good, it's the owner's responsibility. But if it be a hired thing, it came for his hire. In other words, if you hired it out, if you, did, if you rented it, then you, you abide by the rental contract, came for his hire. So in other words, if you have a rental, if you, if you hire something, then whatever the contract is, whatever the agreement that you have made, that's what you pay. I don't know if any of you have rented a car, but when you rent a car, there's a rental agreement and you sign at the bottom, here's what I agree to. And when I was young, it was like, okay, I'll rent this and, and an extra $40 for insurance. Yeah, right. I don't want to pay that. And so you sign up, I, I, I agree not to pay the insurance and I will pay for any damages. And then the whole time you're driving, you're like super nervous that anybody's going to hit you or in the parking lot, you park like 10 feet away from anybody and, and walk a mile to get to a store because you don't want anybody to touch that car and you feel badly about it. Now I just, yes, give me the insurance and then if anybody runs into me or hurts it, I can just pass it back and I'm not under any obligation. But if it's for hire, if it's under a rental agreement, then whatever the agreement you signed up for, that's the way it plays out. And this happens all the time in our world where people sign on agreements they don't read the fine print, but that's the contract. That's what you've signed up for. And if you've paid that, if you sign up for that, God says that's what's fair. You do what you have uh, agreed to do in terms of property. So this is all dealing with negligence, things that happen that cause property loss to somebody else. The basic point is this. God values property and an individual property. And he is saying that if you do something to harm somebody else, their loss through negligence or, or, or what, what else, you pay for it. Take responsibility for what you have caused. The damage that you have caused, take responsibility for it. That's the basic point. Now that deals with negligence. That deals with unintentional, many times, realities. If you could go back to verse 1 to 4, 
there's a different category. Here is the category, not of loss of property because of negligence or because I dug a pit and didn't cover it properly, but here is stealing. And so in verse 1, if you steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five ox for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. So if you take it, intentionally steal it, that's a whole other category. And in this category, you must pay a fine, a hefty fine, five times for that one ox, four times for a sheep. So what's the difference? Why, why, why not five? Why not just a standard? Because an ox is more valuable than a sheep, and God is placing a fairness scale here. So if you steal something more valuable, and we do this in our justice system, you have theft under 5,000, you have theft over 5,000, there's categories of theft. And if you steal a candy bar at the store, you shouldn't. But if you steal a candy bar at the store, that's different than if you embezzle a million dollars from your employer. Those, those are considered different scales. And the punishment is different. And God says the same thing in his law, that if you steal something, you pay back, and you pay, in, in, depending on what it is, either five times or four times the value of that item. Now, in this reality, you'll notice... In verse 3, at the end of this chiastic structure, he says, he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. Because you might say, well, the reason he's stealing is he doesn't have anything. Well, if he's stealing because he doesn't have anything, guess what? He has to sell himself as a slave, as a servant. And this goes back to Exodus 21. If you buy a Hebrew servant, how would you ever buy a Hebrew servant? If they got in this situation. <laughs> if they stole something, they took your ox, and they don't have five oxen to pay you back. They don't have six oxen to pay you back. They have five times more. Then you have to sell yourself. And the, and the contract was paid up front, and you would pay off the debt that you owed, and you would work off that contract. And of course, we understand it could only be a six-year length. On the seventh year, you had to, get, had to go free. But, but the fine had to be paid. And whether that was through your money that you had, or whether that was through selling yourself as a servant for that length of time, the person who had their property stolen had to be paid back and had to pay back at a four or five times rate. You remember when Zacchaeus got saved? What does he give back? He gives back fourfold. This, he's following the law in terms of what he should restore to all those people he had stolen from. Now, interestingly, in verse 2 and 3, in the middle of this chiastic structure, he says, what happens if you harm a thief in the middle of the, the person trying to, to rob you? Well, he says in verse number 2, if you kill the thief, if you smite the thief in the middle of the breaking in and he dies, there's no blood shed for him. In other words, it is not considered a murder. It's not considered in the category of life for life, bl blood shedding for blood shedding. There is a defense here for your, you, you being able to defend your property. There is, the, the, the God says, if you're defending your property and this person's breaking in and trying to steal from you, and you defend yourself, and it ends up in their death, there's, there's no blood shed for that. So he gives the property owner the right to defend his property, even to lethal means. That's given here in verse 2. However, in verse 3, if the sun is up, it's different. You say, why, why would it be different if the sun's up or not? Well, for a number of reasons. The, the primarily in, in, is the reality that at night you're unsure exactly what kind of lethal force you're using. So when you are attempting to stop the robber from stealing from you and you're trying to mitigate that, you may be shooting somewhat blindly. You, you may not be accurate in what you're, what you're attempting. You, you don't necessarily know what's happening because it's dark and you can't see and you're just trying to defend your property and things happen in the dark. But in the, in the daytime, you are more responsible because it's clear. So if the robber is coming on your property, you know that he's coming on his property. You can see what he's doing, and you can mitigate your force so that it doesn't have to be lethal force that you're using to protect your property. There are other means. Not only are you able to mitigate the force that you use because you can see properly and you know what's going on, but you can call for help. There's people around during the day. At night, you're all in your own home. You're all in this society, an agrarian society, homes spread out everywhere. You can't cry for help. But in the daytime, you can just, there's people wandering by, there's people around, and so there's ways of mitigating the problem of losing your property that are not available to you at night that are available to you in the day. In other words, if you resort to lethal force during the day, you didn't have to. There were other means at your disposal. But at night, that was not necessarily the case, and so God says that it is allowable. Also, I think God is mitigating something here, that in the daytime, normal business would happen, and people would be coming and going. 
and mistakes could happen during the day if somebody's taking property off your lawn and they maybe have a very legitimate reason for doing that. But as they're transacting business during the day, that, that, that people aren't just uh, using lethal force whenever they want, that there's, that there's some uh, uh, mitigation of that because of normal business. We do this in the woods for, during hunting season. You have to wear certain colors, and you try to mitigate the potential risk uh, because you, you don't want any accidents to happen. And so God says during the day, it's not allowable. At night, it is allowable if you're defending your property. Now, in verse number four, if the thief is found in his hand alive. So you, you, the thief has to pay back, and if, it, and if he's killed during the act at night, there's no bloodshed, but if during the day, then there, there, is, uh, there is bloodshed for him. You are responsible for that killing. Then in verse four, he says, if the thief be certainly found in his hand, theft be certainly found in his hand alive, with an ox or donkey or sheep, he shall restore double. And this is interesting to me because God knows, our, again, our conniving hearts. So if you steal an ox from your neighbor and they find you with the ox, what can you say? Oh, I, I, I wasn't stealing it. I was just borrowing it. <laughs> I, I, I was going to bring it back later today. I'm so glad you found me. I was just about to bring it back. Great, great. Let me take it back to you. We could come up with all kinds of excuses. Oh, I wasn't really stealing it. I can't pin it on you because you found the theft in your hand and you could say, oh, I didn't mean to take it. I was just borrowing it. I'll bring it back or I didn't, you know, I didn't sell it or I didn't get any benefit from it. So God says, in that case, you still have to pay double. <laughs> you still have to pay back the item plus another of, of, of the same value. You still pay back double, even though you could pretend, oh, I, I wasn't stealing it. So God says, if the theft be found in his hand alive, then you still, you get your ox back, but you get a double ox. You get an extra ox and the person still has to pay. All throughout this system, I think we should see the fairness of God. That God is working to make it fair and fair remuneration for property that is lost or that is stolen. Now, why all these laws about property? What, what, what was the point? Why, why does it matter so much about property? Isn't it just temporal stuff? Well, in, in, in one, one reality, yes, it is just stuff. But in another reality, everything that we have is a gift from God. And when God gives it to us, we are entrusted with that as a stewardship. And stealing and taking what is not ours or abusing the property of others and not taking responsibility is damaging what God has given that person. It's taking away what God has gifted to them. God has given us in Acts 17.25, life and breath. God has given us, 1 Timothy 6.17, all good things richly to enjoy. And ultimately, God gave us his son to die in our place and rise again. So understanding what God has given us, that everything we have is a stewardship from him, we should value the property of others and make proper restitution because it's, it's their stewardship from God. And God has placed it in their care and we should value that as that. well. We should not be seeking to damage the property of other people. We ought to take responsibility for damages that we cause either through direct stealing or through negligence. I think it's interesting as well that God in his law here provides the punishment for these crimes that, is, that evidences the value that he places. What is, the, what is the punishment for killing a human? It's death. That's the seriousness of that. What are all the punishments in here? Money, transactions. It, it, it's a value. It's important. You have to pay it back. But it's an ox. It's a donkey. It's five times, yes, but it's not your life. In other words, there is a distinction God makes between the human life and property. And our stuff is not as valuable as people are. And God makes that distinction clear. The other reality that we should see in, this, in these laws is God understands that naturally we are selfish. <laughs> naturally, we want the best for ourselves and, and we're, we, we are uh, allergic to taking responsibility when people are harmed by our negligence. We like to have our stuff we, we like to borrow and, and, and not be responsible. We're, we have naturally selfish hearts and, may I say, conniving hearts at how we can use the property of others. And I think what Christ does is he changes us. So you turn to Ephesians chapter 4. If we are in Christ, we get the heartbeat of God, that God is not somebody who takes what is not his. God is somebody who gives richly from what he has for the benefit of others. And in all these laws against property laws, we should have a heartbeat of giving. Ephesians 4 verse 28 says this, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, 
Stop stealing, start working. That's, that's the difference Christ makes. Stop taking what isn't yours and start earning something for yourself. There's, there's opportunity in the world to provide for your own needs. So stop taking what isn't yours and start doing an honest day's work to, to provide for yourself. But notice that it doesn't end there. The verse doesn't end there. It says that he may have to give to him that needeth. You say, well, these poor people, they're so poor that they have to steal. No, nope, it's not what God says. <laughs> God says that in fact, how are the needs of the needy taken care of? It's by people working hard to be able to give and charity provides for the needs of others. You work hard in legitimate opportunities for employment. You, you, you work diligently so you can have enough to provide for your family and have extra to be able to give to the needs of others. There's never a place where you say, well, I just had to steal. God says, no, that's not true. And in fact, you are called to work with your hands, a thing which is good, so that you can have extra to give, so that you can take care of the needs of others. What does Christ's grace change us? It changes us from selfish, conniving people trying to get ahead and get the most property for ourselves and, and, and benefit ourselves in every scenario to people who lavishly give what is ours for the benefit of others. That's what Christ does in our hearts and in our lives. And so Paul says, remember the words of our Lord in Acts 20, verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. God gave us his son, Jesus Christ. He gave us the greatest gift that possible in salvation. And in his grace, we should be people who are givers. And so as we go through these laws, in your heart and your mind, it shouldn't be that tomorrow you say, okay, I had this situation, let me find it. There it is, verse 15. So I have to do this and I have to... That's not the point of this. The point of this is so that you learn that, to value the property of others and that you have the heart of God, which is to give. And so you're not counting, okay, I, gave, I took one ox, so I need to give five back. You're lavishly giving. You work diligently in your own work to provide for yourself, and then you give to others, and you have a heart to give. And you're not, you're not, you're not miserly counting every penny and, and, and every, every possible restitution just to make sure it's fair. Friends, if God just dealt with us in fairness, we would be going to hell. The reality is God has lavished his grace upon us. Jesus saves and our hearts shouldn't be hearts that are caught up in the minutia of property law. They should recognize the value of property of others. We should take care of and, and honor our contracts and, and not be negligent. But our hearts should ultimately be about giving to others. It should be about the overflow of God's grace so that we see the benefit for the other, not for ourselves. God knew his selfish people and God puts in the law, don't take what isn't yours and take responsibility when you break the things of others. But ultimately, the goal is not for us simply to be fair. Ultimately, it is for us to be gracious, that we would give abundantly out of hearts that have been changed by Christ. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for the encouragement that we would be responsible people, that we would take care of the property that you have entrusted to us as stewards, and that we would be faithful to repair damages done to others. But Lord, help us not to simply consider restoration or restitution in terms of just being fair. Lord, help us by your grace to lavish grace upon people, to be, have hearts that are gracious towards others, that seek the benefit of the other and not ourselves. Lord, help us to work with our hands, to be diligent, be responsible, to be people of integrity, and Lord, to be people that are faithful to give as Christ has first given to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll close with a song tonight before we transition to our business meeting. 315 is a song that says, I would be like Jesus. As we consider the value Christ placed on us and how he loved us and came to die for us, that we would have the same heart of giving and of grace. So let's stand together and sing, I would be like Jesus. We'll sing a couple of verses.
by your grace to be reflections of your holy character that we would value the property of others that we would be concerned not to take what is not ours but you would give us hearts that give that work honestly that restore and care for the needs of others and that you would have an overflowing heart of grace we pray in Jesus name amen